Hello, and welcome to a common response with a little bit of a difference, because I'm going to combine it with an announcement of the patron vote. Okay, so we have the patron vote live in a moment, and currently, voting carries on until Sunday, so patrons, you're allowed to vote for as many as you like, because remember, it's the top two, the two topics that receive the most votes which win. So, currently in the lead, we have Michael66. If Singtao incidents lead to war, how does the 1939 RNK Force fare against the 1939 IJN Force? With 17 votes. Currently in the lead. Looking pretty good. Second place, well, we have on 14, Martin Peacox, the Queen Elizabeth class. A brave first step, a faltering giant leap, or something else. Possibly a successful failure. Third place, 12 votes, Paul Thompson, the attack on Copenhagen 1801, and the following operations in Danish waters until the fall of Napoleon. Mm -hmm. And then in joint fourth, we have three. We have Glyn Stewart's Orion drivers actually developed in the 70s. What does the 1975 10,000 ton space battleship look like for the USA and Russia? Uh, Colin Cameron's Atrus Vanguard sinks Air de Vincent de Nomeo in 1982. How does this affect the US and the Soviet naval development, if at all? And Jack Ray, the history of Stanflex, and why the US doesn't use it? All 11 votes. And, kind of surprisingly, Diesel Creek's Marine of Karl Gasberg is not in its usual... It's usually third, fourth, sometimes fifth. It's been trying it for a while, but it's currently down quite a long way down. It's not last. Sorry, Carl. It's your flotillas of the Danube. The through the sieges of Belgrade. That's currently in three votes. Again, usually that does slightly better. But no, there are a fair number of sixes and fives. Even a seven. Good. Thank you. And I hope you're going to enjoy them. Now. What are we doing? Well, today, we are doing USS Winchester Comment Response. And that's going to be, oh, hopefully a lot of fun. Now, I'm going to do something slightly different, because I'm going to start off with one of the threads from in the middle of Wichita. And the reason is because it's kind of an interesting thread and a kind of interesting discussion in uh, in the comments. And I wanted to get into it. So this is a thread which went on between Paul from Chicago and Robert Elder mainly. Now, I want to start off by saying something. I'm going to be censoring the language a bit because, Robert, you got a bit rude. In fact, that's me being polite and putting it politely. You got very rude. And the first rule of any argument is, and any debate where you're trying to assuade someone else to your side of view, is the moment you start insulting them, you've probably lost it. In this case, you, ha you have lost it, but I will explain why. Now, Paul from Chicago starts off, I'm going to read the thread out and then I'm going to discuss it. So I'm going to read the thread out, all the responses, comments first, and then I'm going to discuss it. And then I'm going to go back through the rest of the comments on the just because this video has some wonderful comments. And I'm going to change the Christmas comment response to being basically individual videos, as people seem to prefer that, although it will probably take longer to get through them all. But from Chicago, I don't think any US cruiser can be called the best treaty cruiser. The lack of sonar, as deck, means they have a lack of fundamental and required mechanism to avoid or attack underwater threats. It's like the loss of Indianapolis. The ship was lost in the drawing boards. Utterly inexcusable from the US Navy. I'll get into all this. US Indianapolis should have had a destroyer for escort, for destroyers had the required equipment. My dad's ship was USS Louisville. Uh, CA-28, and was hit by two kamikaze in January 1945 in the Pacific, and had an escort back to the States. Indy was a, has a speed record that stands today from San Francisco to Pearl of 29 knots hour, uh, and 29 knots average. Robert Elder, ASW was not a heavy cruiser mission, so no. Mm. That's a firm answer. Uh, 
Robert Elba, from, this is from Paul Chicago to Robert Elba. A ship without sonar cannot avoid an underwater threat, therefore it cannot cruise. Cannot do trade protection or interdiction. It is an ineffective scout due to fear of, of loss to submarine, and it cannot identify the presence of ships in weather prior to the introduction of effective radar. It ceases to be a cruiser. It's mostly rubbish, smallish, a small, fastish battleship whose job is solely to be in a fleet, protecting destroyers and otherwise act as a make weight. Oh. Right. Robert Elba. Language. ASW is not a cruiser mission. None of the heavy cruisers had sonar. The NTK cruisers did not. I f you're referring to the IJN using NTK, which I guessed after reading the rest of your comments, but I usually stick with referring to them as IJN on this channel for conformity uh, across the sources and the way it's read. I have heard of people using NTK before, but I have to admit, when I first read it, I thought you were talking about the Dutch Navy. <sighs> because that's more commonly where I've heard a similar abbreviation. Uh, the RN did not, the, D the DKM did not, and the Italians and French did not. Not a single reputed naval historian or officers has made the argument you do because it's a bovine... Again. Bovine excrement. And you're... This is... You're going very, very hot on this one, but you probably should have gone and done some research. We'll get into that in a second. But we go. Curious. So what exactly did Prince Jürgen hear at Hood's torpedoes at Denmark Strait? Tin can of string. Now, Hood... Then you go into the Robert Elder... Then you go to Hood fire no torpedoes. This is one of those interesting ones where there is a debate as to whether or not torpedoes were fired. All those sort of things. But... We do have multiple German sources which say that Hood fired torpedoes. We just don't have many English language sources which seem to say she did. She doesn't seem to have told Prince of Wales if she was. But, saying that, it wouldn't be the first time a signal had been missed in combat between bat with a battle cruiser. When other more important signals are going off and they're presuming the track's going to be okay. Elder. However, if Hippers heard sonar, that just goes to show another reason why they are what they were. That was a CARP design. Just think what the USN could have done with another, on another five thousand tons when Wichita is already superior to Hippers in every way. Oh, five thousand more tons. Well, she'd have probably had those twin five-inch thirty-eight mounts. Probably six of them, and she'd probably have had another triple eight-inch gun. In his chart. Again, Robert Elder, again, and this is... He did three comments in a row. Again, cruisers did not, in general, have acoustic sensors in, in and prior to World War II, and gunner cruisers did not after. It is almost as though real naval officers think your theory is CRIP. But I am getting what sonar did the... the and the Japanese, the NKTK, mount on the Tone class, the last built, see, uh, their last built light cruiser, or Megami class, or the USA on the Des Moines class, and the last and best uh, cru light cruisers ever built, or Baltimore's, or Cleveland's. The Brits, what sonar that was mounted on the towns? Any of the counties? And it goes on. ASW defense has gone as done through zigzagging, seed, and escorts, not sonar on cruisers. So to support your theory, list the systems used. Apparently, they had some kind of hydrophones on the hippers. So, one example. Do tell us what other systems that were in use in other cruisers. In advance, crickets. Okay, you've conceded, thankfully, that they did have hydrophones on hippers. Well, they had hydrophones on lots of other ships as well. I'll get into this. Paul from Chicago, I think you'll find a little research may change your mind. Again, Paul, I know he's being rude, but... Yeah, don't respond back. And usually, Robert, you do very nice comments, and they're worthwhile, they're worthwhile reading. I'm not sure what was in you this day, but you seem to be really upset with something. Uh, quite a number of towns were fitted to, or refitted to have Asdick. Others had, had as built. All Crown Colonies had Asdick as built or were fit, refitted with it. I believe all the Arfus and Leanders were constructed with Asdick, but I'm out of my library at the moment. Also, of course, all the Didos, the town class refits, were from sensible lessons learned during a hard war. It's not hard to find sources. Google is useful here. I agree with you. USN largely persisted in its construction folly. I would say not all of those ships were designed with it. There is a problem in that, and I'll get into this, some Royal Navy cruisers are actually fitted with ASDIC, and we'll get into that in a second. Some are fitted with basically hydrophone systems to listen for torpedoes. 
And I'll explain it all in a second when we get to it. But it all comes down to Abaker, Creasy, and Hogue. Okay? So the Royal Navy are obsessed with it, and other navies are because of what happens to Abaker, Creasy, and Hogue. But it all depends on what you're ba balancing your weight on, in, under the treaty limitations. I agree with you to let USN largely persisted in its extraction folly. It was literally a fatal flaw for the men of Belgrano and Indianapolis, and I can be some of the other non-Atlanta cruisers sunk by long answers. US Bureau ships recognized the flaw and started putting sonar on the Atlantas. As for hood firing torpedoes, that is well documented. It's also easily found for future. Uh, I recommend you search for yourself and before demanding that of others. And Paul does have a nice link here to kbismarck.com and Prince Eugen torpedo-related matters regarding the engagement on the 24th of May, 1941. And... It is the German sources which seem to heavily suggest that torpedoes were fired, and they had torpedoes. Presumably they came from Hood, if they were fired, but there is also the option that there was a submarine around there, and considering the number of submarines which disappeared in that area, mm -hmm. but I doubt a submarine was getting involved in the battle, I really do, because it would have been quite hard for it to catch up. Now, this is the point at which Paul is very nice. There is something we need to talk about, though. You need to be more polite. You persist in using bad or aggressive language. You're doing it to me, and that's fine. But if I saw you talking this way to Alex or anyone else, you'd already be out of here. Now, Paul, very nicely, is one of the admins. He's one of the people in the channel who looks after the chat, etc. And knows that my preference is that I run the channel to an extent like I run my university classes. You are allowed to debate as much as you like. You're not allowed to insult people. And I can't enforce that on YouTube. And that's in my university class. I can't enforce that on YouTube. I, I cannot. But I prefer it heavily. Because I think the moment you start insulting people, you A, turn the debate from a discussion and something where you can learn into something where personal feelings are involved and people get very rude and nasty and they lose all touch with the actual topic they were discussing. And secondly, you discourage others from getting involved. The people who might have good comment, uh, good points and good information, but who don't want to get involved in that kind of bun fight. And this channel's about learning about naval history. So, please. Now, Hood, then you go with the Hood did not fire torpedoes. As I said, it's something which is debated, and frankly, yeah, the German sources seem to think the Hood did. The British sources say no, make no mention of it. But there again, we don't have that many survivors from Hood. Uh, you claim all the ships had sonar. What is lacking is evidence. I'll be getting to evidence. I note you say nothing of the Japanese, the Raja Marina, or the Frenchies. If you're going to call the others by their names, call the French Navy by its name? That seemed polite, or at least consistent. Right, right. The refusal to support your claims evidence match you're telling me to do my own research, res uh, res uh, do my own resource, or this equals dishonest failure. Claim Karen Cronley class uh, light cruisers all had sonar, and many town class uh, light cruisers had sonar. Source? I'll get to that in a second. Claim the under cruisers had sonar. Source? None, you stinky. No. That's just rude. Now, as stated uh, Paul for Chicago, as stated above, American cruiser design was an outlier. USN Bureau of Ships, Bureau of Engineering, did American, later Argentina sailors have found these disservice by not installing any underwater sensors on their cruisers. Without a full sense suite, American cruisers were not set up for cruising. The loss of Indianapolis and Belgrano and other, I could be several other ships of several islands, Java Sea and Solomons, can be partially or wholly attributed to this design. The reference of failure of imagination doctrine. Essentially American World War II cruisers cannot cruise. There's a different emphasis going on. Okay, again, source for sonar on the county, town, coron colonies, or NT key cruisers, tone class, or others. Uh, your claims come from your... Oh, that's just rude. Okay, so... That's just getting rude. But the point is, despite the rudeness, there is actually an interesting point going on here. So I'm going to get rid of the slideshow for a second. And I'm first off going to show you this. This is an abbreviations list from a pink slip. Now, you have heard me mention pink slips 
occasionally in pink sheets and the pink uh, pink books because they are the list of the day-to-day -day list the Royal Navy kept of pretty much every three days. They would have a list of where every single ship was in the world, and that would be what the Admiralty had as a stockpile to work out what ships were available, etc. It's never more than three days old. There were temporary one uh, temporary provisions pr provided, but every three days goes down in a hard, solid copy for the War Diary. So, A, very clearly, after name of ship is fitted with ASDIC. P, E before name of ship, equals Portsmouth crew, C equals Chatham crew, D equals Devonport crew. Um, standard notice, all the various things, but A is fitted with ASDIC. Okay? A slash A, anti-aircraft ship. C, fitted with catapult. B, fitted with bulges. Look at this. A, fitted with ASDIC. And wrong one, right one. Here we go. We have the home fleet. Just a quick designation of them. And if you look, you'll notice 18th Cruiser Squadron, Town Class, Sheffield, ACP, Hallett of Belfast, ACP, Newcastle. Well, Newcastle, I think, is also ACP. I've got to go back and get a better image. But if we go to this again, put the average up, A, C, and P. A, fitted with Vazdic, C, fitted with Catapult, P, carries aircraft. Now, I'm going to make that a little bit smaller, but I'm going to use it as my point. Why? Abaker Cressy Hogue. Abaker Cressy Hogue. The Royal Navy lost three cruisers, several thousand lives in World War I because those ships had no warning of a torpedo firing on them. So from that point on, Royal Navy ships are at minimum fitted with a hydrophone system to give warning of torpedo. This seems to turn up in pretty much every single design variations of it. Yes, some are fitted with different variations and others. And some just have a very basic system. Some have that system taken out and put back in. The, the thing is, it's your value of it based on the treaty limitations. You've got a limit in under your weight for what you want to do with your ship. The British, because of this experience, tend to put it in. And as you get ASDIC coming in and coming more reliable in the 1930s, the Royal Navy actually starts to stick ASDIC in the cruisers. Because if you're already fitting in hydrophones, it's not that much more to fit in the full ASDIC system. Not because you're going to be going hunting submarines. Believe it or not, no one believes a cruiser should go doing a submarine hunting job. However, what can a cruiser do if it's got ASDIC that it can't do if it's just got a just got the basic system. It can help out its hunting destroyers. The moment you realise you're going to need multiple ships to engage a submarine with ASDIC, and at least one of them is going to be having to fix the position, while another one goes in and hunts it and tries to kill it, and you preferably want two fixing the position, then if there's a nearby cruiser, which they happen to be part of the escort force anyway, and it has its ASDIC blaring away, bing, 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 then the vessel which is using that bing, bing, bing to go and find the actual submarine can go and do the hunting without worrying about revealing its location. So there is a useful reason for it. However, again, I refer you back to the treaty system. Now, there are a lot more navies other than the Royal Navy which put in hydrophones. Even the US Navy would like to fit hydrophones. They don't because of weight. Because sometimes you can want something really, really a lot. But you can want something else a bit more. And they're both useful. But you decide one is more useful for what you want to do than the other. For the Royal Navy, they think about their ships going out around the world on their own. They also think about their ships in terms of their cruisers. They think about that doing a lot. That's a primary mission. They also think about Abaca, Cressy, Hogue. So, Robert, you lose that many people in one engagement to a, sub a single submarine. You've kind of had an egg over your face and it kind of lives in your brain forever. So that's what happens. That's why the Royal Navy does what it does. And other navies, depending on their relationship with that experience, actually have differing relationships on it. 
the Japanese Navy, again, rude the fact they don't. Because they would have probably saved a fair number of their ships if they had. The US Navy has a love affair with it. Because by the time they really have enough sets coming in that they can start looking at retrofitting their cruisers. Their cruisers are operating usually in task groups with destroyers around them. There's no need. Because you have the destroyers. It's principally something you would think about if you're operating solo. And again, it's not going to be used for ship-to-ship -ship targeting. I know there's this lovely idea that's sometimes put up, and I know where Paul's picked it up from, but ship-on-ship -ship targeting using sonar was considered, re at the time, really frigging difficult, if not impossible. And it might give you some warning, but it wouldn't give you more than visual would. And if it was at night... Yeah, that it's not going to be much help because, okay, we know there's an engine over there. But is that a good direction for us to go? No. So, Robert, future, language, please. Try and be polite. Even if you find people really annoying, try and be polite. Trust me, there are comments on the channel sometimes which are really rude directed to, mo to me or they're just... Rude as anything, and I try and be polite back. I always try to be polite if I respond. Sometimes I just choose not to, because I just don't want to get into a, a, a slangy match with someone. Or rather, them be slanging away and me trying to be polite. It just seems pointless and a waste of energy. But, yeah. Cruisers were fitted with Aztec. They were fitted with Sonar. They were fitted with these things. Usually hydrophones. Why? To act as a warning for torpedo attack. I, they didn't want the cruiser to go out hunting submarines. They needed carriers to support hunting submarines because they needed aircraft for that. And so a cruiser might well be hanging around with a carrier as extra protection for her. But what they really wanted was warning of torpedoes in the water. Because then you can dodge. Because, believe it or not, torpedoes are fast, but you can change your aspect of your ship in time with their range, etc., to minimize the likely impact. Once you've got homing torpedoes, life becomes a lot more difficult. But when you're dealing with the torpedoes of the 1920s and 1930s and the beginning of World War II, eh, honestly, a good turn can help you avoid them. Now, you can also spot torpedoes visually, and the US Navy tended to consider that more viable, well, viable enough, because of the fact that if the torpedo, it, it, the torpedo would have to run surface, close enough to the surface, it would be leaving a trail for them to do so, for them to avoid it. And therefore they could save the weight, uh, save displacement for other things. The Royal Navy didn't rely on that again. Because of Abaca, Chrissy, and Hogue. Does that mean all Royal Navy ships were actually fitted with hydrophones? I wish. Some weren't. And you can go down this list and you will find many who are, which aren't fitted with Aztec. Many and uh, Most of the cruisers are not fitted with Aztec. If they're fitted with anything, they're fitted with hydrophones. And as a rule, most are fitted with hydrophones. But some are fitted with Aztec. Towns, uh, many of the light cruisers are fitted with Aztec. Retro, either retroactively or as they're built, because it was you was once you're already putting in the weight and stuff of the hydrophones, the difference to put in the Aztec is not much more, not in a ten thousand ton ship. Anyway, hope that answers your question, and I hope that ends this rudeness, because there isn't need for it. Right then, let's get back to the other questions. And the other ones. USS Wichita. So, and I need some water. I've been talking a lot today already. I need some water. Yeah, it's okay. Sorry, the reason I'm sniffing is because I've noticed that these plastic bottles have sometimes, if I, if they get left for too long, they sort of go funny, the plastic and the water tastes funny. So, I sniff now. It's kind of like a 
university habit of where you sniff the milk. If you go into student digs, you never, never pour the milk before sniffing it. Okay, get into that habit. It will save your life. Well, probably won't save your life. It will stop you spurting curdled tea or coffee out all everywhere over people. Or in my case, curdled hot chocolate, which was just yucky. Um, Rapper Roseback and Mike Cavallo both asked very interesting sort of question, which turns out quite a lot. Light cruiser plus heavy crew cruiser equals medium cruiser. Which is there is an interesting transition design? Heavy light cruiser or is it a light heavy cruiser? The point is, Wichita is a heavy cruiser. They're using a light cruiser hull form, but she has heavy cruiser level armor. She is very much a heavy cruiser in terms of firepower capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, then we have another long thread. Aaron Severus, I once proposed the idea to Drac about the Atlanta class built on a Wichita hull, so basically 14 to 18 5 inch guns, as well as two quad torpedo launchers plus actual armor that could protect the ship. Now, actually, that's a really cool design. That's something I could really get behind. But that is also a lot of firepower. And there's a long discussion about it that goes on in the chat. Uh, well, in the comments. About, well, sort of wish just the, uh, from G.D. Harmon, sort of wish of the class, yes, it's wish of the class, but with reliable proven guns. Could have been put to sea uh, early enough to fight the kamikazes. It could have been and could have been useful, but then you are building a very much a dedicated AA platform. And that was the thing which sort of, I started thinking it through and going, five inch 38s on a Wichita hull, all those ones, it's going to give you a decent performance, but it is very much an AA cruiser. And at a certain point, that's useful, but that's a one trick pony. But there's nothing wrong with that. But you just have to recognise it is a one-trick pony. It's your anti-aircraft vessel. Conversely, post-World War II, if a ship had been built such as that, probably based off the Wichita itself as a hull, it would probably be prime, prime conversion material for into a missile ship. And that thing would have been useful. It's rather, it's a rather an interesting idea. It really is. And as Hugh Fisher does point out, that is very close to the French Colbert de Grasse class, compared just as World War Two. What Atlanta dreams are growing up to be. The thing about the Atlantas and Dido's, you always have to remember, those are war emergency build ships, kind of like the Crown Colonies. Crown Colonies are. Of because they're basically a stripped down town built to be churned out as quickly as possible in war. Now, if you listen to this week's bilge pumps, you will notice that episode 114 that me and Drac are not that keen on the Crown Colonies. Because the actual merits of producing a stripped down town versus producing a full, uh, full, full capability, full size town are minimal in the extreme. In fact, I would argue producing the Royal Navy producing any light cruiser, a six-inch light cruiser, which is not a Edinburgh subclass of a town, after they've built them, is false economy. I can justify our refusers. I would prefer to have a dual-purpose armed tribal than a Dido. The Arafusers I can justify because I, if I'm on the treaty limitations, I need to maximise my cruiser numbers. If not on treaty limitations, well then the other reason I justify the Arafusers is because they will provide me with capability. But I would probably produce them kind of like ARA, uh, ARA La Argentina with the three triple turrets, which is really a souped up air fuser and I really love that one design. And that would be my free triple turret ship, and then I'd be producing towns of the Edinburgh class with the four triples. Because they're designed for four quadruples and then they get fitted with four triples, which means they have plenty of top weight for things to add it on without barely affecting them, which is one of the reasons why 
why HMS Belfast survives so long in service. Because she just has that much capability to be able to be added onto her. They're useful ships. Jade, a happy wyvern. Dr. Clark, the crew were just strategically transferring equipment to alternate locations. Nothing wrong with that. And the thing is, you have to remember, is it's strategically, then transferring, then equipment to alternate and locations. Happy Wyvern, you did a lot of thinking for that one, and it was cool. Also, I'm not sure if I mention it, but this week's brew ships is going to be slightly different. Because this has been sent to me. HMS Belfast. So for the 101 episode of brew ships, I'm going to be answering questions, and instead of reading a book, I'm going to be building HMS Belfast. And seeing what she looks like when she's completed. And I will probably set up a second camera. I will work it out so I can have a second camera that will sort of be looking down on her. On the construction. So I'll have the normal camera looking at me and I'll be chatting through and answering questions. But I'll have a second camera looking down on the build. Hmm. Hope you enjoy it. And the qu today's question is going to be suggestions for uh, future builds. Although, this I didn't get myself. I'm not sure still who sent it to me. I have a suspicion. I have a suspicion who knows my address and who might have sent me that. But I don't know who. So I'm going to say thank you. It was very, very nice. And it didn't quite bring a tear to my eye, but it definitely got kept well away the cardboard box from the assistant, fluffy research assistant, who's currently going through a belated I-must-chew-cardboard phase. Luckily, he's for his own survival sakes, he hasn't decided he should chew books. Just cardboard. It's it, it's amazing. My dogs, they, they can chew all sorts of things, but they know. Books? No. My desk? No. Shoes? They can get away with. I won't care. Touch the books. There'll be problems. There'll be no biscuits for a month. Mm-hmm. Joseph Askins, what the modern-day commercial for the, by the Royal Navy to the Imperial Japanese Navy would say in the context of World War II? The Royal Navy's standard greeting package in times of war includes complementary torpedoes, 6-inch and 8-inch shells. If you upgrade at no extra charge, 15-inch shells may also be included. Welcome to the Caribbean. We hope that you enjoy your stay, however brief or permanent it may be. I was thinking more that if they, they just hear in modern-day terms the Pirates of the Caribbean theme tune, if the Japanese managed to make it to the Caribbean. Because let's be honest... If they did, they've either managed to fight their way through the Panama Canal, in which case there are worse things happening than just the Japanese reach in the Caribbean, because America's probably collapsed at this point. If the ja if it's got to a cent the level that the Japan can fight its way through the Panama Canal, the US has collapsed for some reason. Or, alternatively, they have managed to go through the entirety of the South Pacific. Get round uh, get round the South, uh, South America. And come up to the Caribbean. In which case, by the time they reach there, their ships will be in such a blasted state that, frankly, it will be we're boarding to, uh, but we're boarding you not to take your ship from you, but to save your lives. And that's before we get on to the fact that the most of the local defence forces in the Caribbean are pretty darn tough. I mean, they are well trained and very capable people. Even their current descendants are, they might come from small forces, but never doubt their capability to really do some very interesting things to you should you cross them. It's kind of like the Gurkhas. But the Gurkhas are more internationally well no uh, internationally known because they've been doing the more p they, they've done a more high profile operations. But the gentlemen and ladies from the Caribbean are not people you want to discount in an argument. They are probably people you best want to leave to one side and quietly presume that they n hope they don't want to take part. Marcus from Asonium. The rank of the director of Ella made a comment once about the Wichita in a discussion of a Dutch modern version of armor cruiser. Seaman to the Wichita, slightly better armoured, a 9.4-inch gun instead of 8-inch. It's interesting that this concept was still considered and built. 
It would have been an interesting ship, the Dutch one. <sighs> there are so many good designs which don't get built. I mean, seriously, there are some seriously good designs which don't get built. We often talk about the mortars on this channel, mainly because it's my antidote to the burn. The fact that the burn was built worries me. The fact that the mortars weren't built worries me as well, but the one sort of cancels out the other. Uh, interesting. Interesting ships, definitely. Uh, Lions, I agree. Wichita sounds a really nice cruiser. Do you only... Uh, do you only... Okay. I think some grammar's missing at some point, Lions, in your comment here. Because um, you've written, Do you only come outside as I do see what you're saying about the 8 single 5... And I think there's supposed to be a slash 38 because you put 538. And I was thinking, hang on, there's torpedoes mentioned in this? No. It's 5 slash 38. However, I would rather personally I have had 6 twin 5 inch 38 instead of the, uh, for the uh, normal out. Honestly, so would I. But weight wise, it was felt the scope better options within the treat limits. Plus, the five, twin 6 twin 5 inch 38 layout wasn't yet the normal layout. That's the generation after this ship that becomes the normal out. And as Gina Hammond puts out, something to be said for shooting 8 guns in 8 directions as opposed to 12 guns in 6 directions. Now, 16 guns in 8 directions, well, that's the other thing. If you did have those extra 5,000 tons, you could possibly get it to 16 guns. 16 5 as uh, in 8 twin 5 inch mounts, and still get your 12 8 inch guns in 4 triple mounts. That would be a very, very scary ship. With an extra 5,000 tons, the amount of things you could do to that ship. <sighs> Wichita would be known as the thing which turned up, took names, and, well, if it bothered to take names, it would take names, but if it didn't, there just still wouldn't be any survivors left. Be kind of be a tribal of the heavy cruiser world. Um, Nicole Ross. Not related to this. I saw Devotion and do not recommend it. Oh. Okay, that's a movie which I've managed to avoid so far, and now you're going to make me feel glad, I'm sure. Reasons. Dogfight with drop tanks attached. Why? Mission briefing planning at a bunk. Uh, was there no other building? Wrong course air flight landing approach. Oh, so they want to try and kill the pilot. And no crash barrier landing with a full deck park. Okay. All right, so... So I understand that when they're filming movies, they pay a lot of money for their actors. Now, I'm going to use my face in the narrative, but let's be honest, no one paid this much money for this mug to be on your screen. So, they want the face to be seen. That's why they often are seen flying without a face, or without the oxygen mask on, and all sorts of things which real people would actually be wearing and doing at the time because people want to see this. It's why they kiss the way they do, when no one else would kiss with such an exhibitionist pro uh, approach, because they want to still be able to see their faces. Instead of cupping someone's face, they, you know, play with their hair, all, sort of, all sorts of other things. They change from books to the, mo uh, to the movie. However, there are also times when they do frigging stupid things. Because, let's be honest, landing an aircraft without, a de without the crash barrier raised is a good way to write off a lot of aircraft if anything goes wrong. Yes, you get this great visual because you can line it up, the cameras, and not have the crash barrier interfere with your shot. Brilliant. But if that plane overshoots, you're killing people. The crash barrier is there to protect not just the planes, but the people forward on the flight deck. It's to stop it. If the aircraft overshoots, it either goes high enough to avoid the crash barrier, or it goes into the crash barrier and doesn't go any further. That's the aim. And it's why you get students sometimes turn up in classes when you're teaching a general class, you're talking about naval history, etc. Or military history. And they turn up and they maybe they are just doing a general history class as part of their course you know that they get if they're doing some some points if you've got students doing law or economics or political science or something like that they will end up having to pick up a couple of history modules just to get the credits 
and it's part of their course. And suddenly they're in there, and they're not people who've really looked into it. And suddenly they they sort of ask questions, going, "What do you mean? There's that? That doesn't? I've never seen that in the movies. Never seen that." And you're going, "Well, that's because the movies don't show real life. The movies often don't show real life." Um, I would wish someone would do a Band of Brothers style approach to a naval operation on a carrier, on a battleship, on a destroyer. You'd have to do three different seasons of it to capture the differences. And a submarine. The thing people often don't remember about the submarines is that if we consider some of them, they had such bad toilets in them that when they were underwater, the crew would actually use buckets rather than the toilets and would just have the uh, the bucket open so they could quickly get to it and then they'd chuck it out when they got there but sometimes uh, when they got out of water but sometimes the smell got so bad that when especially u-boats when they returned to germany returned to france the smell would be so bad that when the dock workers went inside the submarines they'd faint they could actually really damage themselves because of the noxious fumes. They had to come up with all sorts of procedures to try and clear the air in the sub. And trust me, a submarine, remember, is designed to keep air in for its survival and its buoyancy, not designed to expel air. So it really becomes something. And they never mention that in submarine videos. Movies, never mention it. They avoid it, discreetly. Andrew Reynolds, is it as bad as the bombing runs in Midway? Nicole Ross, I enjoyed Midway more than Devotion. Oh my lord. I wanted my money back from Devotion. It was only $5. Ouch. Uh, Mark Guthrie, so what do you think heavy cruiser is? Alaska's, to an extent Deutschland's, some of the planned supercruisers would all be roughly where a heavy cruiser, armoured cruiser, design continuation would have ended up. Robert Elders put Des Moines. Um, sort of. Sort of. I think the Des Moines would have been there, but I don't think they'd have had 8-inch guns, and I think they'd have been slightly bigger than that. But, yeah, 17,500 tons is probably at the lower end of where the heavy cruisers should have been. I'd reckon they'd have been about 20,000 tons. If we consider history, cruisers were often the same size, if not bigger than battleships. Okay? Yes, we point out battle cruisers. But... There were actually, before that, there was a long-running tradition of armor cruisers being bigger and than battleships. Why? Because a battleship is a solid lump of steel which turns up to beat the mm out of ships and take a beating itself and keep on fighting. Okay? That's its job. That's what it's designed around. A cruiser has to be fast enough to get places in emergencies because... It doesn't know where the enemy is, and it's being sent to react to things, whereas a battleship is usually being sent where you know where the enemy is. Hence the whole issue of the Royal Navy versus the 2nd Pacific Squadron. Um, if they'd end up fighting each other, the Royal Navy knew exactly where they were. You don't need your your you don't need to build a battleship to go hunting the enemy. You know you find them using the cruiser. That's the cruiser's job. But the cruiser is also doing the presence mission, it's doing the whole going around the world mission, and it has to carry personnel for that, and it has to have the facilities for entertaining and all the other things. Uh, those are all things which take up space, and this is why cruisers often end up being, sometimes they weigh less but still have bigger dimensions than battleships, sometimes they even weigh more, they displace more, and are bigger. So, yeah, I... I don't see that under the treaty system, but the treaty system, I think, is missing a thing, but uh, missing a point by having capital ships up at 35,000 tons and then going, now we will keep all our vessels below 10,000 tons. You, I can understand where they're coming from, because they don't want people building mini battleships to get round it. But, I think you could have probably got away with saying... Right then, uh, especially if you'd done it as a case of 40... If you'd set the limit of battleships at 40,000 tons, which I know I argued for in the Equitable Treaty, and say 14,000 ton and 16-inch guns, and then say, right, then you're allowed, let's say, 15 of them. You're also allowed 15 cruisers. If you're allowed 15 of those, you're allowed 15 cruisers. Uh, 15, uh, 15 what we called... Um, what they'll call armoured cruisers. 
up to 20,000 tons and 12 inch guns. And then everything else, all other cruisers have to be less than 10,000 tons and less than 8 inch guns. And then you're allowed destroyers, which are allowed to be up to 2,000 tons and or two and a half thousand tons and five inch guns you know oh or maybe four inch guns and just make it a clear break the whole way up of four inches below that's a destroyer or a sloop um eight inches and below that's a cruiser like uh, like um 12 inches below armored cruiser 16 inches below capital ship but there again, this is me with hindsight looking at it and going, yeah, that was a big gap in four structures. Christopher, all the cruisers we have in World War II are various light cruisers. Even excluding uh, the remaining battle cruisers, there's still the Alaska-class large cruiser, which comes in during the war, and I think I was talking about the start of the war, and the Deutschland-class, which uh, you're in, in your estimation, Christopher, are an armored cruiser. And the Alaska's the proper heavy cruiser. They're certainly not built to capital ship sounds. I would agree the Alaskas are definitely a proper heavy cruiser. And they are closest to it as I answered before. But I would also add the Deutschlands are a bit of a special thing. Because they are certainly not a pocket battleship. They're not a coastal defence ship. I know they do get some sort of... People suggesting they are, but they are supposed that they are using the tonnage allowance to uh, to replace their pre dreadnoughts which were not coastal defence ships either. Uh, they are the closest thing you can say is they are a heavy cruiser, but due to their armour and their overall design and speed, they are a very poor design of a heavy cruiser. It's just their size, which is what's going for them, and that uh, argument. George Hughes, Navy crews that can acquire supplies and equipment ahead of schedule are still highly rated by the fleet. There's generally one or two members in any crew that can find what is needed, when is needed, usually before the officers know it's needed. Those are very useful pe personnel. Phil Andrus, you see, Johnny, a Wichita happens when a New Orleans-class cruiser and a Brooklyn-class cruiser have really strong feelings for each other. Ah. <laughs> oh. Jack Ray comes up with an Abbott and Costello comedy routine. When Wichita was on construction, I wonder if one guy said, that's a hull of a ship. And the other replied, yes it is. Uh, Todd Webb, shakedown cruise to the both Indian Islands and Bahamas. So which admiral's task of being on such a harsh shakedown cruise? I don't think an admiral was on there for the cruise, but I think possibly one might have come down to visit and meet them where they when they put, did a port of call. The Caribbean is actually often used for shakedown crews and warming up, even by the Royal Navy as well. During World War II, you have even carriers are sent over the Caribbean to cycle up because it's a nice space, safe space to go. Interesting enough, also, they considered... Southeast Asia, the South Pacific, and Indian Ocean, safe places to go for warming up during war. And that's one of the reasons why you have Exeter over there to deal as part of the force, which is a deter it's supposed to be deterring the Japanese. Exeter, of course, performs really well at Battle of the River Plate. Comes back to the UK, needs a massive refit and overhaul. So what do they do? They t turn her down into ordinary, send off the crew to other ships, so disperse the crew. Then, once they've refitted and basically rebuilt her, they recommission her, give her a new crew, new captain, and then they send them out to the Far East to try and learn up and work themselves up. This is one of the reasons why there's a difference in performance. A, they have new equipment. B, they have a rebuilt ship, which is they're still learning its nuances of, because after a ship's been through that much damage and rebuilt, it will develop new nuances. And it's a new crew, which has never worked together before. And if we think about that, the example I would give is, let's say you play in a five-a-side football, or what is sometimes known in some parts of the world as soccer team. If you play in such a five-a-side group, if, let's say, five friends just go along and play, and they've never practiced before, never played, they know each other, they're all friends, they might do okay, but they'll probably get mullered by a team which practices together, even if they're not friends, because they know the way each other plays and they'll be able to work with each other. Now imagine you've got five people who've never met each other before. It's their first training session. They've done one training session, and 
Then at the end of the, uh, the training, five minutes before the training session is supposed to be over, and I'm supposed to go back and start evaluating the training session, the coach comes out and shouts, Come on, we've got a match! Here's this team which are cr this team which we've been playing together for the last three years, have had nothing to do but practice and work together, know each other inside out and their technical geeks. Let's play! Now, imagine the likely result of that match. That's what you're talking about. And that's what happens with Exeter. So that's why places like the Caribbean, which are not likely to have fighting, are good places to send your ship to go and do its shakedown cruise and prepare itself. Because it's unlikely to happen. Benjamin, I agree with Rapid Razorback on the medium cruiser idea, or just going with cruiser. I think that the post-treaty Newport News a class 8-inch gunships are a proper heavy cruiser compared to the Worcester class 6-inch gunships. Very much enjoyed the video. But yes, in the 19th century, the US ambassador to the UK is was referred to as the US minister to Quarter St. James. Still are, I think. I think that still is one of their titles. Because to the UK, it is, of course, a sort of the Quarter St. James. They had their... Uh, their documents into because that's the official residence of the government for those scenarios. So they don't go and hand their 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 submit their papers to um, the House of Commons. They don't submit their papers to Ten Downing Street to the Foreign Office. They go and submit their papers to the Court of St James. Although sometimes it has taken place at Buckingham Palace instead of being received at the Court of St James at the St James Palaces. Thank you, Spendthrift. Oddball, on the subject of extra armament on ships, JFK's PT-109 always comes to mind, specifically the 37mm uh, anti-tank gun that the crew managed to scrounge up and attach to the foredeck. And the ki that kind of behaviour isn't something unique to just the USN. The US Army, Marine Corps also like to find extra machine guns to put on vehicles. And it's a behaviour that continues to this day, although to a lesser extent. Howard Carfrey, it has different names depending on the service. The US Marine found it on post. There are still energetic practitioners in the USF, it's called Comsha, and in the US Army it's called Scrounging. Don't know what Navy calls it. Acquisitions. I'm not sure, but that's what most Navy seem to term it under. Have we acquired this? Oh, good. For the Alaska, Alaska is the only real heavy cruiser. Hmm. John Fisher, when praising Wichita, you must take into account there is a, about 10 years tech advance and building knowledge between it and the first treaty cruisers. There is a massive advantage, and if it was not better than its ancestors, the USN shouldn't be ashamed of themselves. Yes, but it wouldn't be the first time. Queen Elizabeth class? Our class. Um, in fact, the Royal Navy's done that a couple of times. Produced a very good class, and then produced something really not good. Or rather, not as good as they could produce. And, again, the US Navy's done it, and other navies have. But the reason I'm using the Royal Navy as an example, because, shamelessly, I can get away with it for the Royal Navy, because I'm British. If I use an American example, I will get people going, Oh, you're just being nasty about the Americans. And I'm not. It's just, navies can do it for all sorts of reasons. Usually cost. Usually, cost is what will lead to lead to them getting a less capable class for uh, following a, a much more capable class. I feel real. Thank you. Now I can point to this when next person asks me what's the point. Of, what's the point to Wichita in World of Warships? Just been saying she's the missing link between the uh, between the New Orleans and Baltimore, which, to be fair, is exactly what she is. Also, can you imagine the what the USN would have done if they'd expanded, uh, expand, expanded, uh, expanded the Wichita after something the displacement of the Admiral Hipper? As I recall, the Bill uh, Bartimores was small, slightly small displacement of the Nippers. Um Well, Robert Elba was right. Yes, you get a Baltimore. Damning how much better the Wichita was to the Hipper. Um, actually, I think you probably, if you do it in the same period, I. Before the Baltimore's come in, so the Baltimore's come in, and the USN sort of goes, "Yeah, let's put it this weight in this, and this weight in this, and don't go for the 12 8-inch guns." But I think if they'd had 5,000 more tons to blow when building the Wichita, I think she'd have had 12 8-inch guns, and I think you'd have seen the Baltimore's be even bigger because they would have followed on with 12 as well. 
but they would have had all the armor upgrades and all the other upgrades they had put in them over the Witcher design, and yeah, imagine that with 12 8-inch guns. Ooh. Thank you, PD. Tony Trotter, US Wichita was the first 8 inch 55 caliber main battery warship with turrets to allow each gun to elevate and fire individually. Beam was slightly narrower beam of 62 foot versus the Northampton class, which was a beam of 66 feet. USS San Francisco, 17 battle stars. USS New Orleans, 16 battle stars. USS Minneapolis, 17 battle stars. USS Portland, 16 battle stars. USS Louisville, 13 battle stars. USS Wichita, 13 battle stars. USS Wichita was considered for a missile cruiser, but later the Navy used a battle more class cruisers and Cleveland class cruisers instead. Which makes sense, because let's be honest, Wichita had been used far more in World War II than other ships had been, so it made sense to not use her. And John Soff of a Scythe. Thanks for the detailed information about Wichita. As she was the ship named after the largest city in Kansas, the nickname for this ship was the Wicked Witch. This was influenced by the movie The Wizard of Oz, which was popular at the time. I grew up in Wichita, Kansas, and most local residents are proud of the record this vessel ended during World War II. I believe she had 13 battle stars during the war. Now, I will say this. I have heard this before, her nickname has been Wicked Witch. But... I have also seen U.S. naval artistic practices, and if this ship was nicknamed the Wicked Witch, where is the Wicked Witch on one of her turrets? Why is a gun barrel not painted like a broomstick? This is the U.S. Navy. I, you have standards. You, I've seen the artistic work they do. So I, I want to believe you, but I don't see the artistic work to prove it. Please tell me someone has actually done it. Please tell me someone on this ship was painted a Wicked Witch. <laughs> Alright then, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and um, take care. And yeah, I'm going to end by putting up the the um, the, pink sh uh, the pink sheet pictures. So I'm going to say thank you here, take care, and enjoy. And if we put that to one side, expand that. 